Hi, this is Dan Lexi from Dan Schultz Outdoors, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. Hey y'all, I'm Johnny. And I'm Colleen. And, and we're, we're the Keel Quest. Quest. And, and we, we want, want you to keep, keep the adventures alive. alive. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, this is Darren from Ride Paddle Repeat, encouraging you to keep the adventures alive. This is David from Beastly Ironworks saying keep the adventures alive. Hi, I'm Dan Mayock. Keep the adventures alive. Hi, I'm Kevin Collin, the Happy Camper. Remember, keep the adventures alive. Awesome! Woo, buddy! Shug here! Keep the adventures alive. I am. Ethan here, the Avid Outdoorsy guy, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. We're John and Aaron. Keep the adventures alive. Hey everyone, it's Kylan from Lure of the North, and I encourage you to keep the adventures alive. This is Sky North telling you, keep the adventures alive. And now on with the show. Hey, well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy Tuesday to everybody. This is Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show, another episode, number two in the season three of the show. Uh, my name is Dennis, also known as Canoe Hound, and I just wanted to uh, welcome all returning people, and I also wanted to welcome anybody that might be new to the show. Uh, if this is your first time, hopefully you uh, you enjoy tonight's topic or, or tonight's guest and hopefully uh, you'll see some value in it and you'll subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up because we have a lot of great shows coming to you here in the near, near future. Uh, sorry for the uh, late start here. Uh, we just wanted to make sure we had our system check going and everything else there. Uh, we got uh, our guest waiting in the basement there. If he wants to turn on his camera and mic at any time, he can and I'll bring him up as soon as uh, we do the guest introduction. Um, I just wanna get started with a few announcements here before the show uh, or before we actually introduce our guest tonight. I uh, want to start by thanking, last week we had a rather unique show. I invest, invited a bunch of guests up, uh, people that are regular viewers. Uh, many of them you may see in the chat from time to time, and they're people that follow the channel quite regularly. And we got to hear stories about what they've done over the summer, the shortened canoeing season, the shortened hiking season, or whatever it may be that you're doing outdoors. But it was kind of nice to uh, have that interaction with uh, with the viewers to open up the season and uh, make this season our get this season off to a great start. So thanks very much to all of you that participated and everybody that watched the show. Uh, it was a really good time. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, quick congratulations to Susan Shepard uh, from Sue's Outdoor Crew. She was the winner of last week's swag giveaway. Susan, if you're in the chat, congratulations and your prize is in the mail officially and it will be to you in a, a couple of short days depending on Canada Post and snail mail, right? Uh, 
just a quick shout out to my channel sponsors. Uh, we actually have a new channel sponsor this week, and I'm very excited to announce that. But first, we'll start with Algonquin Outfitters, our good friends there. They are celebrating their 60th anniversary of uh, being in business right now. Uh, what a great company they are, great morals, great ethics, and I'll tell you, they know their stuff. So if you need gear, if you need knowledge, that's they're the ones to talk to, especially if you're going to that Algonquin Park area. So by all means, congratulations to Algonquin Outfitters on celebrating 60 years in business. Uh, shout out to our friends at Kid Products, makers of the Kid Twig Stove and Reflector Oven, uh, longtime supporters. Our newest channel supporter or sponsor is Hunter and Harris Paddles. Very excited to have them on board. And as a matter of fact, uh, Milan and Mira will be our guests on the show next week, and we will be talking everything about paddles. Uh, basically, we'll be finding out a lot about Hunter and Harris as a business, and then they will be telling us about proper fits for paddles, maintenance, and all the other neat things. So if you think you know everything about paddles, tune in anyways, because I guarantee you're going to learn something. Uh, also, our good friends over at Backcountry Coffee Company, Great Signs and Graphics, and the Short Hills Beer Company, thank you for your ongoing support. It is uh, greatly appreciated. And if anybody ever needs anything uh, that these people offer, please do check out their websites. You can find their uh, website addresses down in the description below. Uh, very good companies to deal with. Uh, you know, cl class one, class one, I say. Uh, let's see here. I got something new that I'm going to be doing this week and over the next couple, uh, coming weeks. Uh, Algonquin Outfitters right now is running the Algonquin Outfitters Charity Paddle Art Auction in Huntsville. And I got a little bit of a video snippet that I would like to run there to give you a little bit of information about it. Maybe you'll want to go there and check out some of their paddles or you could do it online and maybe you'll want to bid on one. There are all kinds of fantastic artists, but let the video speak for itself. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Matt Huddlestone. I am the manager of the Algonquin Theatre and we are thrilled to welcome Algonquin Outfitters for the Paddling Art Auction in 2021. This is our first event of the year and we're asking everyone to come down and please check out these incredible paddles and canoes from artists all throughout Canada and Ontario. The dates for the auction, you can go online, are September 13th through September 27th. Our opening hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. with a special viewing Saturday, September 25th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Don't forget to come and visit us. Everything is online at Algonquin Outfitters. Looking forward to seeing you. There you go. There you have it. Uh, did you see some of them paddles in that picture? There's some beautiful works of art in there. Uh, every piece is, is truly a masterpiece. So if it's something that you're interested in, there is a link down in the description that'll take you right to the auction site and you can actually check out all the cool paddles that they have and the canoes as well. And uh, by all means, you know what, all, all the, uh, the benefits that are being raised through that go to a great charity and uh, it's well worth supporting. So uh, check that out by all means. Link is in the description. Uh, really quick, uh, member shout outs. Uh, Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show is still looking for a lot more channel members. Uh, if you're looking for a great way to get more out of this show and if you'd like to support the channel, this is a great way to do it. Uh, channel members all receive a channel membership uh, decal, sticker uh, uh, by mail, and uh, all kinds of exclusive perks and benefits that uh, you get with being a member. Uh, for more information on that, you can actually check right down here. You'll see a join button. You can do that at any time, whether we're on a live stream or any, any time you visit the channel. And there's all kinds of information on there. If you would like to become a channel member, that would be great. Uh, really quick here, a couple more quick things before we get on to uh, tonight's guest. Uh, upcoming shows. Next week, as I mentioned, we have Hunter and Harris. We're going to be talking everything about paddles. On uh, September 28th, uh, for one of the first time, we, we've uh, past guests that have been on the show before, but never together. Uh, we have uh, the winners of season three alone show. Jim and Ted Baird will be on the show, but we're going to be talking about this 700 kilometer uh, canoe journey that they took up in northern Manitoba. So you'll want to make sure you uh, you look into that on uh, uh, September 28th. And then on October 5th, there's a, uh, a YouTuber out there that I have really been enjoying his content. And uh, he's got a really cool, unique uh, style of editing and uh, great trip videos and stuff like that. Goes by the name of Xander Budnick. If you're not familiar with him, you will want to tune in and make sure uh, you get to meet Xander. 
and uh, we'll get talking about his channel and the success that he has with his uh, rapidly growing uh, YouTube channel. By all means, once again, the links are in the description below if you want to look into these uh, shows in the future. Uh, this is the time of the night here where we get into our, our toast for the backcountry. Uh, this is uh, sponsored by buymeacoffee.com. If you ever want to buy Canoe Hounded Coffee, wrong clicker here. I got a new system here and I'm trying to get used to it. But anyways, we'll even forego that right here. Uh, if you ever want to buy Canoe Hound a coffee or a beer, by all means, visit buymeacoffee.com at canoe or forward slash Canoe Hound and uh, be a great way to support the channel. So if you have your beverages handy, like I do, and I'm going to crack that beverage and you can do that down in the basin there too, uh, Mr. Guest, I see you down there. <laughs> Get your drinks ready. Uh, tonight's toast goes out to all the volunteers and outdoors people who take the time to maintain our backcountry camps and trails. Thank you for all that you do. Cheers. Bottoms up, everybody. That's good stuff. Rather unique beer this week. A beer called Minivan by a local brew house, Cayman Kettle. Check them out if you can. And uh, let's see here. Last two things before we get into tonight's guests. Uh, if you have any hot topics or guests that you'd like to see on the show, by all means, drop me an email at canoehound at gmail.com. Uh, I would love to hear your ideas, and I'll see what I can do to make it happen because I'll tell you, without your ideas, shows like tonight's show, I know I had a lot of requests for tonight's guests, and it's finally happened. So all you got to do is make the requests, and I'll do all the footwork to make it happen, right? And then also, if you have any questions for myself or tonight's guest, uh, I'll be opening up the stream after 8 o'clock uh, to some guests to come on and ask a question. I do have a few rules just so I can try and get as many people on based on uh, Les's uh, how much time he could actually spend with us tonight. But uh, by all means, we'll try and get you up here to ask a question. Uh, we're just going to stick to one question per person so that we can try and get as many people through. That's that for that. All the intro and the blurb is over. We got a nice full house here from the looks of things. And let's get on with uh, tonight's guest. Uh, so tonight's guest has been a longtime favorite of mine. Uh, I believe I started watch his, watching his original shows from their first airings in like 2005 on the Outdoor Life Network and Discovery Channel. Uh, he's a celebrated keynote speaker, musician, and author, and has traveled all over the world and has made numerous talk show appearances, including The Ellen DeGeneres Show, The View, Jimmy Fallon, Craig Ferguson, Larry King Live, An Hour with George Strum Strondropolis. <laughs> I have a hard time with that one, man. And now, of course, Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. Uh, he's an award-winning producer, creator, director, and a host of the popular TV series, Survivor Man. Please welcome to the live stream tonight, Les Stroud. Hey, wow. I have Survivor Man on Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure. Well, now I'm finally, I'm finally reaching the peak. Now is what's happening here, being on Canoe Hound. Oh, there we go, there we go. Thanks, Les. You just made my day. <laughs> hey, I, I want to, as a fan and as a, the host of the show, I, I really want to thank you for uh, for agreeing to come on the show. Uh, you've been a very popular request for the show, and it's uh, it's a it's going to be a good time tonight. I'm hoping. Ah, oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm here to let them down. There, no, don't, let's not do that. Uh, first off, I, I, you just got back from Alaska, did you not? I did, yes. You did. What's going on in Alaska that had you out there? Uh, I was up there on business. I had an, uh, like a meet and greet appearance sort of thing to do. I still do those once in a while, not very often, like literally one a year, maybe two. And uh, so I went up for that. But but as is my usual want, I turned that into a week-long time up in Alaska, which I do that a lot with my travels. Oh, I'm going there to do this thing. Well, why don't I stay, come four days early and stay three days later and do all this other stuff? And so I went up and and uh, went back to my old friends at the Kodiak Brown Center, uh, Brown Bear Center on uh, Kodiak Island, and uh, was filming actually there uh, the uh, the Kodiak Brown Bears uh, with uh, Stacy and all the gang there, and looking to see about some more filming I might do up on Kodiak Island. So yeah, and and just tooling around Alaska, hiking and sea kayaking, and and uh, seeing the bears, that kind of thing. That's awesome. Just out there being a survivor, man, or less Stroud, eh? A little bit more less Stroud, more less Stroud than anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if there's if there's anything when you get to know me is is that uh, uh, I might be that guy, but I certainly uh, understand creature comforts and know how. Well, the, the whole point of being that guy is I know how to make myself comfortable. So right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, a lot of people cut their teeth on the knowledge that you've bestowed on all of us throughout uh, all your different uh, shows and series and 
you know, books and well, everything that's, else. That's a good way of putting it because in the end, um, what was I really doing? All I was really doing was teaching. I was just extending my teaching career as a survival instructor. That's all I was doing. And a lot of times, you know, when you say cut your teeth, a lot of times that information was basic, not basic in the terms of that we should belittle it, but more in that this is what people don't know, you know, and these are ways to know things. And these are simple ways to achieve what you need to achieve or to survive, basically. So, Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, and all I was doing was being a survival instructor, nothing more, nothing less, really. Right. So bring, bringing that up now, like, uh, let, let's talk before Survivor Man. What, what was Les Stroud? What, what, what made your wheels turn before the concept of Survivor Man and uh, teaching all this stuff? What, what, what kept you busy? Well, give me, give me an era. Give me a time frame. Are we, are we six years old, 16 or, or 26? Well, what, let, let, okay, let's start with, say, for instance, maybe your first experience in the backcountry. Um, was it like a canoe trip, hiking trip? Uh... Well, the real first experience as a youth was nothing more than fishing trips with my dad up in Muskoka, Ontario, um, going out behind the cottage near Bracebridge and playing, you know, yeah. you know, a 10 year old kind of thing playing and watching ants and, and, and caterpillars and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's the real, you know, beginnings of me actually touching the earth, actually touching trees and laying on rocks and that kind of thing uh, in, in that era, in that age. But I, but, you know, I, I certainly did not grow up with any kind of real mentorship or guidance in the outdoors. My parents weren't outdoors. Yeah. I said, I went fishing with my dad. Yeah, sure. I did. But that was a very, in the, in the very sort of, late 60s early 70s cliche kind of way right your dad your uncle bugs fishing for that big lunker of a largemouth bass kind of thing right. um but but my parents were you know there was no sea kayaks or canoes in our yard sort of thing and and um and you know i grew up in the west end of uh, toronto in mimico ontario and there was no you know connection to the outdoors there really so really for me it was just that playing around in behind the cottage you have to fast forward to the age of 26 as a very late bloomer before I have my first can canoe trip. Right. You know, so, um, and that was, uh, that was kind of arranged through some friends of mine. I think it was actually like a church group or something like that. And they were all going on this canoe trip and I got invited to go along. So, and, and, you know, once I dipped my paddle in the water for the very first time on that trip, I was, I was certainly smitten with the whole idea. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And where, like, whereabouts in your life did you realize that, hey, I, I can turn this into something uh, as a survival instruction? Like, you obviously had to learn all this stuff from somewhere, too. Where, where did that knowledge base come from? Yeah. Uh, when I was around 24, 25, I was, there, it was the metamorphosis from being in music, because for, for, from 14 to 25, 26, all I, or 20, 14 to 24, I guess, was, you know, all I really wanted to do was music. I wanted to be Neil Young. You mm -hmm. know, I wanted to be Jimmy Page. So the metamorphosis out of that musical venture, which the reason why I went there was because at 14, I discovered rock and roll. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I, I, you know, I put the uh, studying of ants and caterpillars on the back burner and became into music. So at, at 25, I was sensing the change was coming when I was about to make the move away from music since I did not become Neil Young or Jimmy Page. Uh, although I did very, very well with it. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I was, I, I think I was smart about it. You know, I had, when I, I was producing much music, the nation's music station at the time. And when I left, I, I actually went from doing that and meeting sting and people like that to driving a garbage truck. Like I totally said, I'm going blue collar and I'm sh sh taking everything off and uh, from my past of music, but I knew I wanted to get involved with nature somehow. And so what I did was I started taking those weekend courses, you know, it's like, Oh, there's, I can learn how to paddle a whitewater canoe by going with this group and paddling down the Humber river. You know, if you can imagine, you know, if I see myself now on the Nahani or in the Arctic paddling big rapids, yet my humble beginnings were on a, you know, bare, basically a, a bunch of riffles on the Humber river, mm -hmm. you know, in West end of Toronto with somebody who, you know, probably worked at mountain equipment co-op or something like that, teaching a weekend course. And I, and, and the minute I, you know, maybe even that course, you know, I saw him, I saw the guy teaching 
and thought, oh, I like that. I, I, I want I want that. I, I, I want what he's doing, you know. And mm-hmm. so I took every single course I could. And really what I decided first was I wanted to become an excellent outdoor guide. That was the first time in my life I had a serious, focused agenda, goal, and knew that I wanted to get it and knew how to get it. Up until then, I did not know how to achieve what I wanted to achieve. But something clicked. And and that's what I endeavored to do for many years, become an excellent outdoor guide. In my humble opinion, I believe I did. And I loved every single second of it, you know, guiding, sea kayaking, dog sledding, wilderness first aid courses, running those after I learned myself, survival courses, you know, hiking, backpacking, canoeing, of course, flat water, white water, on and on it goes, you know. So, so when did I, somewhere in there, somewhere in there, watching these other instructors thinking, I can, I can do what she's doing. I can do what he's doing. Well, how'd they, how'd they get to do that? That's not fair. How, how, oh, <laughs> this course, oh, uh, canoeing, what, level one, level two, level, um, okay, level one, when's the first course? Oh, a, a, in April, okay. Level one, canoeing, flat water, here I come. And I just, you know, that's the that's the, the true humble beginnings of anybody in the outdoors. You don't just go from thinking you're going to be a guide to being one. You, you, you take courses, you know, yeah. and, and that's what you do because it's a different era these days. Right. And do you, do you have uh, like um, inspirations? Like, is there anybody out there in the uh, outdoors community that, that is a true inspiration to you that, uh, you know, that you may have learned a lot more from than others? Bill Mason. Yes, Mm -hmm. please. Classic. Yes. Hap Wilson as a further inspiration for what you could do with it. Once you have those skills, Hap Wilson, Tomogamy, Ontario, Mm -hmm. horrible guide. Wendy Grader who ran and still runs Blackfeather Wilderness Adventures. I think those three people, those three individuals, uh, probably the, the, the collection of those three probably did more to inspire me to take that version of my life, the canoeing, guiding, outdoor adventuring version of me. Let's forget survival for the moment, right? Right. Um, those three individuals, Wendy Grader uh, has been running Black Father Wilderness Ventures for years, and she's a brilliant human being and a wonderful soul and taught me a lot. Uh, and I just not by teaching me, but I just watched her and learned a lot from her. Hap Wilson, I admired and respected. We're actually very close friends now, and I admired and respected what he did. Great um, guy. And there was a period of time, uh, it was a tangent story, when I was a guide in Tomogamy, and it became this thing. I had never met the man. But I started going to campsites and I'd, I'd see this little this little pile of beautifully spit, split wood ready for the fire and some some kindling in the fire pit and then a note. And it would be from Hap Wilson. And I had been doing the same thing. And I was like yeah. chasing him around to Mogami. We were, you know, and one day classically we met on the river. It was a wonderful way okay. to meet up. We met on the river. I had my group. He had his group. He was settled in the campsite. We were coming through and, uh, oh, hi, shook hands. And uh, uh, long story short, it was actually many years later that it turns out that his son and my son became best of friends. And we met again that way. And now right. we are very close friends. So Hap Wilson that way, I admired what he did. You know, his guidebooks for, for canoeing to Mogami are bar none. Try to find a guidebook as, as excellent mm-hmm. as Hap Wilson's work anywhere in canoeable country on the planet. I, I challenge you that because you won't. There you uh, go. Speak of the speak of the man right there. Hey, Les from uh, Happen. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. The guy's a goof. Let me tell you. The truth <laughs> the is, I wouldn't paddle across a creek to meet. There you go. Happy. Guy, you know, I just like oh man, this is so embarrassing. And and you know, and Hap, your books are all wrong. I'm fixing them all. Okay, I'm, all the, you're missing the portage. You're off. You were off by 20 feet one time on a portage trail. Okay, I fixed that. There you go. Uh, so there's Hap. Uh, I can't believe he's here now. I'm, now I'm caught off guard. Oh my gosh! If Bill Mason right pops in Hap, now. Uh... I know, Hap, I don't have scotch. I'm sorry. It's a glass of red. But here's to you, my friend. And I'm sure you got my email from yesterday. We have the Mountain River to do. We'll talk. Mm. That's awesome. Well, Thanks that. for typing in there, Hap. Let me finish that story by saying, yes. and I know Hap will agree with me that Bill Mason never got to meet the man. I 
in the end was able to paddle with his son and I met his his wife, his widow. Uh, but never met Bill Mason. Um, here's a story. I was in a survival class at Humber College and uh, the instructor came in and said, hey, everybody, uh, did you hear that Bill Mason died? And and I said, who's Bill Mason? And that thus began my love affair with the work of Bill Mason and Path of the Paddle, Song of the Paddle and all of his wolf films and so on. Yeah. Water Walker, of course. And he inspired me in that. I often say, look, I'm the first and the only guy to ever film himself and make an international career out of it and all that. It's a bit of a lie because Bill Mason filmed himself with a Bolex camera, no less. Mm in the middle of, you know, the snow, (laughs) you know? So I remember seeing that thinking I took, I have scenes in my film work completely stolen from water Walker, you know, let's just say influenced, you know, as we say, you know, just like when a musician is influenced by the Beatles or somebody, right? Well, I was influenced by Bill and I, and I attempted to emulate him. I also attempted to emulate the movie, never cry wolf in some of my scenes too. So uh, I love you too, Hap, by the way. So, yeah, there you go. If you ask, you know, for the canoeing world and my guiding adventuring world, uh, when I was first starting out, learning from Wendy Grader, admiring and respecting Hap Wilson, and uh, being taught to dream by Bill Mason. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a great, great list of inspirations. You know, uh, Hap, I, I cut my teeth on, in tomogamy on Hap Wilson's uh, tomogamy book. Like, that was my Bible for many, many years, right? I uh, think I burned through, well, not burned through, but you used up three editions of it, right? Oh, my, so, yeah, mine were all torn and, and, and you know, oh, yeah. were once wet and now are dry kind of kind of thing. You know, Happy, you've never signed one for me, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, and that's, that's one of the, you know, we all know as canoeists and outdoor adventurers that uh, we are addicted to map porn. And, yeah. you know, and, and Hap made these maps so beautiful and, you know, he was smart enough. I know he's listening, so this is really just pandering in the moment. But he was smart enough to to say, safer to paddle this stretch on the left side unless it's April. Then you're going to want to take it straight down the middle because the water's too yeah. high. You don't yeah. get that anywhere else in, in, in guidebooks. And that's what I loved about his books. I, I just recently, here, I'll tell you, I just recently did a trip up to Wabakimi. Here's a story for you. And Hap, I was going to talk to you about this, as a matter of fact. Years ago, I spent a year living in Wabakami Provincial Park. It's now the park where I was then was not the park. Okay. I paddled every route, made uh, copious notes, came back in, was going to make a Wabakami canoe routes map. This before, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I would have met Hap by then, but I didn't know him as well. And um, I endeavored, I, I was going to do that, and I decided not to. Because another individual who had been up there a lot longer, it would have been like me going to Tomogamy and making Tomogamy canoe routes maps. It wouldn't have been right. Someone else was already there doing it. So I backed off. In the end, they never, they never did do it. And so the government put together a Wabakimi canoe routes map. No offense, government. No offense to whoever put it together. It sucks. You can't now, to their credit, there's a small disclaimer that says, don't use this as a guide for canoeing. Yeah, don't. Because <laughs> Why bother? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, it's, it's, you know. So you, and again, I'm, I'm now I'm repeating myself, but you do not get the attention to detail that Hap gave mm-hmm. uh, in his work. Uh, I, I, I'm addicted to maps and addicted to guidebooks, and I've, I just have never found it anywhere else, like like what Hap did with Tomogamy. There you go, Hap. This is now the Hap Wilson Praise Show. Let's there we go. You have to go back and watch the episode with Hap. He's been on the show here a couple of times, and he's always a pleasure because he's such an awesome I don't have time person. for that. I'm not going to listen to Hap talk. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Yeah, this is his turn to listen to you talk, right? So yeah, this is good. Yeah. He's gone. He's probably gone. Or he's like, yeah, I'm Stroud's on. Actually, he said him and Andrea are sitting on the mountain behind the lodge. Uh, and they you know, got well, Andrea, mountain. now there's a person I respect. At least phew, at least Andrea's there. She brings, there she brings class to Ab's life. So after all this here, like you've had your inspirations and you've learned, you said, I can do this, I can do that. Then comes Survivor Man. Like, how, how did this whole concept of Survivor Man and wanting to take it to air where you write, shoot, produce all, all, all yourself? I believe I read in your bio that you're the only person to have gone worldwide um, broadcasting with all that solo stuff going on. That That's pretty big. Yeah, but you know, all it is is necessity. Necessity is the mother of, of invention. Right. And I had to invent. 
because I had some necessities. And what were those born on? So, so we'll go step back a bit. Really, every Survivor Man began in 1987. 1987. There are people listening who weren't born then. Mm -hmm. All right, what happened then? I watched a film by the NFB called Survival in the Bush. And it was clearly a bit faked and staged. But it was a guy spending a night in the woods. And I remember thinking, now that is a real interesting idea. Fast forward years later. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm now teaching survival. So I should do some survival courses and some survival lessons and film myself and put it out as a VHS tape. It was that era. So I'll, I, will, I will do this as a VHS tape. Okay. But many years passed. Technology changed. Never really was able to do that because it's difficult. The technology wasn't there. And, uh, but I kept that idea always stored at the back. You know, a great idea is always a great idea. It's just all about timing. And uh, literally go from 1987 forward to the year 1999. So was that 16 years? Oh, yeah. so 15 bad years. Yeah. And the uh, series called Survivor by Mark Burnett came out on, on CBS television. Now, now it wasn't, uh, it was just a bunch of hard bodies playing out things and scripts and things that Bar Mark Burnett had written. It wasn't really anything to do with survival at all. But I remember thinking, huh, I've been saying for years, this is a very cool and interesting topic, you know? And literally, uh, you know, for those listening, I'll say, you know, I, I took my idea. In the meantime, I'd filmed myself living in the for a whole year in the bush with my ex-wife at the time. Right. So I'd filmed that. I'd made a documentary film called Snowshoes in Solitude. And I and I thought, I like this. I like filming my adventures. The idea of filming the survival stuff. Well, VHS tapes are long gone. Now it's DVDs. Right. But still, how do we do this technically? Right. So I I actually um, tried to pitch it. And I'll tell you, pitching it to my friends in the industry, after having done this documentary film, Snowshoes and Solitude, so now I had these friends in the industry, and they laughed at me. I told them on this interview, I just said, you know, I found myself, uh, well, first of all, no, let me back up. I, I pitched it finally to this at Discovery Canada, a science show. And I said, listen, you know, seven days alone, no food, no water, just my camera gear. What changed? Why could I do it then? And I could not do it two, two years or even one year before. Mm -hmm. The Sony VX1000 changed everything. It was a camera that was small and light and the, and the quality of the film, the tape, was just barely enough that broadcasters would be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Kind of, sort of. I had to lie to them a bit. So... I went out and, and I, I pitched this idea for, I said, listen, I could go out and, and well, they were talking about this new severe series by Mark Burnett. And I said, okay, well, I can go out and do it for real. We all know that's fake. Why don't I do it for real? And they said, okay. Uh, then I called them up. It was a cold call sitting on my bed and track pants, calling them, pretending to be a film production company. Cause I had snowshoes and solitude under my, under my belt. And, and they said, okay. Sure, let's do this, Les. And I went out and I shot what, what would be ostensibly the pilot for Survivor Man. It was called One Week in the Wilderness with Les Stroud. And they began to air it on the At Discovery Canada show. Well, they'd had slumping ratings for three years. This little thing I did gave them the best ratings they'd seen in three years. And so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we did like 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. At the end of the week, I said, you know, we could put that up. Or no, they put it all together, featured it on Sunday. And then they said, well, what else can you do? I said, I could do it in the winter. Oh, yeah, let's do that. I went out and did it again. Now I have two ostensibly hour-long versions of me spending a week in the wilderness, summer and winter. And uh, I could go into a story about how the Survivor Man name came about. But in any event, I now called it Survivor Man and pitched it as a series that I could do around the world. I went down and I met with Jill Offman, who was running Discovery Canada at the time. We're right off this it being a big hit with At Discovery Canada, the news program. <clears throat> and there's the story I want to get to. Quote, unquote, this is exactly what she said to me. Condescendingly. Less. No one is ever going to want to watch somebody survive on television. 
<laughs> and I said, you're wrong. And I know you're wrong. I don't care what position you're in. You're wrong. Sorry, Jill, if you're listening, you were wrong. Very wrong. So I walked down the hall and I went to Anna Stambolic at the Outdoor Life Channel. And she said, you're kidding. Jill passed on this. I've been watching. Yes, let's do it. And the rest is history. Yeah. So your question is, what caused me to want to do this? It's the answer to the way I've done it for 30 years now. Well, all right, no, so 20, sorry. This stuff, I mean, in, in film before that because of much music, but let's say whatever it is, 22 years. I just wanted to teach the skills. My goal was to make a VHS series on how to do fire bows and shelters. Then, oh, maybe I'll do a DVD. Oh, I can't believe I'm going to be able to do this on television. All yeah. with the idea that if I have to do it for, if I'm going to show it rather than here's how you do the fire bow, everybody. Instead, why don't you watch me needing the fire bow to be warm for the next seven days? That'll bring about a, a very dramatic story. So I did not set out to be a TV guru. I did a, a survival, survival guru. I did not set out to be a TV celebrity. I set out to teach wilderness skills. Yeah. And I owned that spotlight for about four years until they decided to copy it. Uh, that's a whole other story, which you might get to or might not get to. I don't know. But uh, in the end, that's what I set out to do. Just teach wilderness skills that I, to this day, am very passionate about, whether it's the J-stroke, the fire bow, or knowing I'm awesome at setting up tarps. You know, those skills or knowing yeah. how to recognize fireweed. That's all I intend. That's all I wanted to do. And that's what Survivor Man endeavored to do. No, that yeah. was it. And, and you look at the spinoff now, eh? like you, you, on television, the shows that you're seeing, you know, you're seeing the alone, um, you know, na these naked and afraid and stuff like that. Shows that are, are pretty much produced, well, kind of produced. But the, a, a lot of that spinoff, I bet, has to do with the history of what you've done with trying to teach people survival skills. Because there is an interest oh. for it, a huge interest. Look, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be braggadocio. Yeah. Without Survivor Man, you don't get man versus wild. You don't get dual survival, naked and afraid, yeah. alone. You don't get the genre without what Survivor Man did for four years on its own. It became a big hit. And simply because I refused to cheat my show, I refused to stay in a hotel. I refused to have a crew with me. I refused to have people make my shelters. I refused to deliver. 26 episodes when I could only manage to squeak out sometimes six in a year because it hurts. Because yeah, of that, yeah. they finally said, well, screw you, Lestrade. We're going to bring Bear Grylls over and make Man vs. Wild. And the rest is history. That's the watershed. So you've got yeah. Survivor Man doing what it did and the refusal to cheat what I was doing and the networks getting mad at me and frustrated and saying, fine, we'll do Man vs. Wild and we're going to do exactly what you do, but we're going to fake it all. And then the watershed goes off of that that brings you naked and afraid and alone. Now people I've met quite a few people who are on alone, including the head instructor. Do you know what they do every year? They go down to, I think it's New Mexico or someplace like that. They watch survivor man episodes as training for alone. Mm -hmm. And look, it's a long jibber jab and I don't want to get into it, but the, in, in the end, yes, the people on alone are truly out there and, and, and yes, they're actually hurting, but the problem, not, not the other shows, the other shows they're, doing a lot of pain and they're hurting, but things are staged horribly from Bear Grylls to, to dual survival to naked and afraid. But alone, they're actually out there doing the survival thing. The problem is that the producers and the editors manipulate the crap out of it back in Los Angeles when they put it all together or wherever their offices are. It's not the story that actually happened. Case in point, and my cap on this, I know a guy who was on the show. He, he made a fish net and caught five fish and they didn't show it on the show. Mm -hmm. Because it looked too good. It looked like he, he he didn't look like he was suffering. My case in point is that you, you can watch alone and you can know for sure they're hurting, but you're not seeing the whole story. You're not seeing the real no, story. No, all. By all means, so, no. so there you go. And, you know, do I have a little tinge of bitterness in what I'm saying? Sure, I do. You know, they ripped me off. You know, they just because I, I refused to cheat it. They just said, fine, we'll fake it. And off it goes. But on the other hand, hey, that's life. I don't begrudge them. They can, I'm sure Bear's laughing all the way to the bank. Good for them. Yeah. Um, I get... I got to go to sleep at night. I got to go kiss my son and my daughter goodnight and not feel like a fraud. And that's what was important to me when I was, you know, producing Survivor Man. Moral and ethics. You know, I'll scratch that question off my list here because I was going to touch on that whole thing. And I think you just summed it up.
<laughs> it's a longer story. And, and it, you know, if I was on my third beer, I would probably not shut up. But um, yeah. because it was quite an event and, it, you know, that that story took a few years to play out. And there were there were things that happened in behind the scenes by the networks that really uh, hurt and rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, uh, opportunities that were taken out from underneath me because I would not play the network game cheat the show and deliver 26 episodes in a year so they could make millions of dollars. So, you know, little things, you know, I was booked on Oprah, they canceled it on me, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. things like that, they don't go away. I mean, you know, I can, I'm, I'm a bigger man than that, you know, yeah. but am I, does it, did it piss? Of course it pissed me off. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, come on. I mean, I can look at it and go, you tell me where the survival genre came from. You know, let's go look at the history. And so, but on the other hand, let's go on the, on the bright side of this. I got something really good to be proud of, you know, yeah. and, and again, maybe that sounds vain and arrogant. I, I I don't care. I know the history. And in the end, I just wanted to teach these skills. And that's why today, if you look at posts in my Facebook and all the social media and all that, people are just like, yeah, you're the real dude. You're the original. You're the authentic. I, and I'm really honored to get that stuff. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I'm look, I'm, I'm not, I'm no saint and I'm guilty of a lot of things in my life, but teaching bad skills is not one of them. Yeah. Here's uh, Marty Morissette saying the only thing he doesn't like about Survivor Man is not enough episode. <laughs> well, <laughs> apparently, if I cheated it, Martin, you could have had a lot more. Yeah, you know I what? Want to, I want to know something. First of all, is Hap Wilson, Hap, let us know if you're still on because if we are, I'm, I'm going to show you something. Carry on there. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, your 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 Survivor Man series, like I said, I, it first aired, what, 2005, right? 2000. 2000? 2000? If you want to count the pilots for At Discovery Canada, uh, sorry, 2001. And the reason why I always remember that is because I was finishing the edits when uh, when um, uh, September 11th happened. Okay. Uh, when 9-11 happened. So I always remember that. And I delivered it right after that and they aired it. So uh, 2001 is when it uh, aired on Canada as a pilot, let's call it. Then 2000 and uh, end of 2003, beginning 2004, somewhere in there is when Survivor Man proper uh, launched uh, on uh, OLN. Thank well, you, Anastasia. Discovery Dollar. Channel. And uh, Discovery Channel in the United States. Thank you. Wow. Cool. Sorry, you're breaking up a bit there. I don't know if it's my system. Hey, everybody, I got new internet, by the way. And that's a big deal yeah. because I've had uh, I've had the worst internet. But, yeah, so, yeah, I was going to say, though, but the point I was going to make there is, uh, you know, your, your Survivor Man series is probably the only show I have ever watched, like, multiple, multiple, multiple times. You know, like, uh, you know, your New Guinea and, and Australian Outback and, and all, all them shows, all, all the original years, right? If it's on TV, I, I can't click past it. It's it's one of those things. I've seen the show 10 times. I still got to watch it. You know, the airplane well, rack you. here. It's, yeah. a, it's a, you know, when you when you had to get hella backed out because the weather, things just turned for the worse for you guys and all that stuff, right? I, I liked it because it is real. So thanks for staying I think, true. I think, I think also... It didn't look like anything else on television. Right. Uh, so I, you know, there's a lot of, okay, I'm going to keep talking while I, I want you to see something. There's a lot of um, rock stars, for example, that like Survivor Man. Why? And they would say, man, hey, Stroud, you know, we'd be on the tour bus and your show would come on. And it just didn't look like anything else we ever saw. And, and I couldn't stop watching. And so I, I don't know. I didn't endeavor to make a TV show. I wasn't trying to be derivative or look like any other show in existence. And you know, that's a good thing when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to be noticed, I guess, on television is to mm -hmm. be unique uh, and not be derivative. I'm just walking over here so that hop can see something here. This I'm in, I'm in Southern Oregon right now. And this there's the hop Wilson. There we go. There's oh, my Hap yeah, Wilson. Yeah. Look at that, Hap. See, that is a our wall of fame, Hap. And then some work we got in the Arctic. And then another friend of mine, Jane. And uh, uh, so that is, anyway, I wanted Hap to make sure that he knew that we celebrate his work. And, of course, the other pictures are also proudly displayed in, uh, in Canada. Anyway, you can go now, Hap. And uh, bye, Andrea. There you go. Love it. Thanks, he says. You know, I, I, car I carry Hap's artwork around with me everywhere. I've got a tattooed on me. So it's the only tattoo I have is Hap Wilson artwork. You know, well, Hap does pointillism. And uh, hang on a second. I have to do something here. 
Where'd that go, honey? Uh, oh, this right here. Hang on. There we go. Uh, it's called uh, pointillism. And you don't see pointillism anymore very often. And perhaps brilliant at it. I love it. I just love the feel. And of course, the scenes, you know. And by the way, Hap, your, your, your picture of the, um, of the little wood stove hangs above our little wood stove. So there you go. Okay, cool. enough Hap Wilson. This isn't the Hap Wilson interview for crying oh, out. Les Troucho. Survivor Man. Take, take, take him somewhere. Get, just, let's stop this right now. So I, I read somewhere too, Les, that, uh, let's see, I, I'm going to read it as I wrote it here. I understand you consider yourself to be retired. Uh, really, you seem busier with new shows. You've got a uh, children's book that you put out, um, which I need to pick up for my grandson, by the way. I got to get him started on the right foot. He's only 10 months old. Uh, you know, you, you've got new series like Wild Harvest. You've got uh, the Surviving Disasters. You've got your director's commentaries that you're doing on on uh, on YouTube. Uh, how, how do you consider yourself to be retired? I know. <laughs> oh, my myself, goodness. You know, I think it's the matter of... Hap Wilson is a real artist. I'm a fake, mediocre artist. And I I, I say that because... I just, I don't know. I just think I'm very mediocre at everything that I do. And so, but I still like to pretend that I'm an artist. And so I think as an artist, you never retire. Like it's just, you just, and I, sure. I mean, I don't have a job, um, but I, I guess I, I say, I, I, you know, I guess semi-retired is probably a smarter, uh, uh, I will pass that along, Hap. Uh, it's probably, semi-retired is probably a smarter way to say it. I don't know. Dude, you, you, this is my, this is the big year. I hit 60 this year. Oh, congratulations. So, you know, I know I only look 29. But That's, you do. Uh, so I don't know. It's just I can't retire. I mean, I can't. No, I can't stop doing things. Maybe what it is is I want to s stop the game, the game of calling the networks and going through meeting and email and meeting and email and meeting and email and, meeting and, email and trying to. I just I never played it before and I don't want to play it now. And, and the way television has gone is horrifying in many senses so i think that's what it is and i'm just like i don't care what netflix wants anymore or discovery or his i don't care you know i just i'm, I'm having a love affair with youtube right now everything i've ever done is up on youtube i own mm -hmm. everything i've ever done uh which makes it very uh much of an outlier producer so sure i'm gonna stay busy and hat before you go don't forget we have to do the mountain you gotta answer my email uh, so see what I mean? Like I'm always setting something up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sort of I don't think I'll ever be able to stop. I, but I want to be that 90 year old guy who's still writing a novel. I want, I want that to be me. Well, you're creating your legacy, man. That's uh, that's what you're doing. Uh, you don't want to stop. You got to keep creating. Right? Well, I think, you know, I think that work that we create that goes beyond the physical that can last for, a very long time, not forever, but a very long time. And I could go spend a lot of time working on my garden. But after I sell this place and move on, it's just going to be trashed and changed to something else anyway. Yeah. You know, or building a house. And after, you know, 20 years, some other family lives in it and tears out the room that I built that was so cool. So to me, it's more about my music, my film work, my writing, stuff that maybe... If I'm really lucky, just might live on for a long time in the world of, of media and wherever, however the medium is captured for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Can we uh, can we talk a little bit about uh, what you got going on with uh, Wild Harvest and uh, you know surviving disaster and stuff like that? The Wild Harvest series, I I'm really enjoying this. Um, mm -hmm. it, as an outdoors person myself, you know, almost every outdoorsy person wants to go out there and learn about what wild edibles are out there you take it a step farther and find your your chef friend or preparing these like Jeff Paul yeah, yeah yeah and and i want to mention kevin coswin too um who's our trifecta partner in all of this so yeah. when you are learning survival skills there's a number of different pathways you can go and sure i love building shelters and doing the fire bow and hand drill and tanning hides and doing bows and arrows and pottery and basketry and everything but the skill that right from the get-go I fell in love with was learning how to recognize wild edible plants. Instantly, my lawn was never cut again down in Mimico. 
when I was still living there and starting to yeah. take these courses. And I became that guy you know, with the messy lawn. No, I became a guy with all kinds of wild edibles on my front lawn. So I was making dandelion fritters for dinner and clover tea, you know, and fireweed for dinner. So, so the, the, the edible wild plant thing I've always been in love with. Uh, long story short, I met um, Chef Paul Rogalski uh, and we kind of connected a bunch of years later and said, you know, we should do a show together. I said, yeah, I would, I'll go out and find all these plants and you turn them into something amazing because all I know of plants is how to use them in a survival situation. So yeah. I can teach you how to gather cattail for survival. Which was a cool oh. episode. I liked you up and yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, but Chef Paul, phenomenal chef, one of the, listed as one of the top 100 restaurants in the world, his uh, Rouge restaurant in Calgary, Alberta. Right. And you're in Calgary, like Rouge restaurant, Calgary, Alberta, Chef Paul Rogalski, go say hi. Paul is brilliant and he can take it. I can, it's the easiest thing I've ever done in production in my life. We The first day, day one, uh, this is a dandelion, and these are sword ferns. Day two, you guys call me when you need me to eat, and the show's done. It's the most amazing production, so much fun, and Kevin and Paul are so great to work with. So uh, Kevin has another series called From the Wild. You can see it on Vimeo. Um and uh, where he features more hunting and stuff like that. And he's brilliant. He, he shoots great food porn, as we say. So this was an opportunity to say, this isn't about survival at all. This isn't about hurting. This is about loving the dandelion or fireweed or, or morels or what have you. And showing you what you're going to really do with the cattails in a kitchen with a great chef. Mm -hmm. so it's Wild Harvest or Les Stroud's Wild Harvest. Uh, we had to do that legally. Uh, th th and it featured, it's featured on PBS in the United States, PBS stations, featured by American Public Television. It's on National Geographic Asia, 57 countries. And it's on, it's about to be featured in Canada on uh, Blue Ants Channel, Cottage Life Television. Okay, so yeah. uh, um, I haven't signed that deal yet, but they've offered it to me and I'm going for it. And they're really great people. So, uh, uh, so yeah, that's Wild Harvest and easiest, most fun production. Uh, maybe not the most fun. It is a lot of fun. The most fun was doing Bigfoot. But it's by far just a wonderful time for Kevin, Paul, and I. And it's a, yeah, I love making that series. So we're in season two now. It's done. And we're hopefully going to start shooting season three. Yeah. Now, I get your newsletters. And yeah, I've seen that that uh, you you mentioned on there where they can be going. You also mentioned your podcast uh, on there that you have going. Okay. So... Yeah, like you say, I'm not retiring, am I? Um, uh, <laughs> Where this thing from? It back. Back. Come on. <laughs> Smell the roses. Um, we'll go back to You're not retiring. Masters as well. It's fine. Uh, you know, really what happened was I, um, I began a number of initiatives and everything said yes at the same time. Then I got really busy doing it. So now everything's launching at the same time. Children's book, Wild Outside. Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud, special for PBS and stations, APT, American Public Television. Wild Harvest, now we're into season two. Surviving Like Les Stroud, the podcast. It wasn't supposed to be like that. I've been busier during the COVID pandemic than I have pre-pandemic. So uh, the podcast, thought I'd started up when nothing was going on. And now, as a matter of fact, Doing this interview is stopping me from editing my next podcast, which is what I was doing minutes before I got on this this computer. So um, Thank you. the podcast thing was a matter of, I like to talk, as you can tell. Yeah. I got an opinion, as you can tell. And um, that's for fun, you know, but it's also meant to be uh, enriching and engaging and, and edifying, edifying. So I talked to, I know a lot of really cool people. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know if Hap's still on, but uh, I interviewed Hap, and that interview is about to be edited and coming out on season two. So I interview these awesome people, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's called Surviving Life with Les Stroud, but it's really kind of like I can do it. I've got the skill set, and uh, so why shouldn't I do it kind of thing. And Terry O'Reilly and the Apostrophe Podcast Network, they host it. Terry O'Reilly, if anybody's heard of him. Is a marketing guru genius and very well known in Canada. Has the CBC show Under the Influence and his own podcast Under the Influence. And we regret to inform you and alone together that so I joined that podcast family, the Apostrophe Podcast Networks. And yeah, I'm launching that. So 
to keep going, surviving disasters. That was like something I should have done years ago. But in the end, it is a one hour special that um, shows the normal human being, like your aunt who lives in Wisconsin or your cousins who live in Florida, how to survive natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, blackouts, freeze outs, you know, you name it. And that special is used as a pledge special on PBS stations in the United States. Then it'll be aired regularly after that. So we have the Wild Harvest TV series. We have Surviving Disasters with Us Stroud TV series and special. Wild Outside, my first children's book with Anik Press, which is written to the kids, for the kids, showing them, telling them of my stories of Survivor Man, showing them how they can get out in the outdoors, giving them tips and tricks. And the podcast, you know, Surviving Life with Les Stroud. And then after that, phase three is all my music coming back again. So, yeah, I'm busy. You know, uh, I know I'm rambling right now, but we have the time. Uh, and I just, I always wanted to be known as a prolific artist. I will always be insecure enough to say that I'm a mediocre artist. But at the very least, I want to be able to brag being prolific. And I and I think I'm getting there. I'm getting close. Mm -hmm. How many people in the chat uh, have taken a harmonica into the backcountry with them, which I'm sure is inspired by less? I know I have, and I suck with a harmonica. <laughs> you know, the, even well, that. Suck and, blow, suck and blow with the harmonica. But blowing yeah. harmonica on the Survivor Man episodes, that wasn't contrived, but it definitely was me saying, yeah, I'm going to blow some harp so that people didn't think I was a one-trick pony. Right, right. I was saying, yeah, I know I'm surviving and I'm showing you shelter, but check out these chops. Doodly, doodly, doodly. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then before you know it, I was on air going, oh, beauty. <laughs> right? And people go, hey, that guy can really play. What did that, now what did that lead to? So you see these little things, right? Yeah, yeah. I add that in as some spice. What did that lead to? Playing with Alice Cooper in a charity concert. Yeah. Right? Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk it? Exactly. Or Johnny <laughs> Lang or Robbie Krieger from The Doors or Tommy Shaw from Styx. All because on my silly little show, I played the silly little harp for 60 seconds. And so you, you never know unless you unless you, you try, unless you let it be known, and unless you make the point of saying, you know, I'm, I'm not just, you know, what do you think I am? Just fire bows? Like... You know, if anything, it, it often, if there's one thing that upsets me is, is when I'm putting stuff out on my social media and that, and I get the constant, I just want to see you build another shelter. And I, and yes, that's the voice I hear in my head when I read those. So it's like, really 20 years of it wasn't enough for you, you know? So no offense. I'm really proud of what I did. It's just yeah. not who I am. It's what I did. Yeah. Uh, Norma Vince says, ramble away, Les. He's re she's really enjoying this, right? And then and to those with the uh, the harmonica thing, you know, I have, uh, hubby did, <laughs> I suck too, <laughs> guilty. And yeah, I like so. to say I suck as well, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, I get, I touch on one more thing here before we get into at eight o'clock. I usually do a, a quick squat, a swag giveaway, which I will get on to. And then after that, Les, um, the show goes till about nine o'clock. Are you comfortable with taking some questions from uh, some of the viewers coming on panel? Well, what if I said no? I'd look like a show. Well, then they'd be out of luck, right? <laughs> no, I'm out of here. Click. I, I didn't have the opportunity to consult with you before before the show about that. Uh, so I, I just like to make put it out there so I'm not putting you on a spot for sure, right? So, um, But before we get to the swag giveaway, I want to I ask you about the Bigfoot series. Um, some people hate it. Some people absolutely love it. What, what's your take on it? Obviously, you, you produced it. And... Oh, look, it's a phenomenon. Yes. Can't argue that. Yes. Existence or not, who cares? It's a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that's been in existence, according to the records, for a few thousand years or many thousands of years on record, many cultures, many continents. It's a phenomenon. The phenomenon's always been there and heated it got heated up, yes, in the last 15 years, 10 years. I've had experiences out there, and I'm very knowledgeable of wildlife and, and such, but experiences that I can't explain unless I bring that into it. And I'm like, ooh, 
Well, it could have been, uh, I suppose. Never seen anything. So as a film producer and as an outdoor adventurer, all I'm doing, and so for those people who really hate it, chill, take a chill pill. All I'm doing is adventuring and filming and doing stuff about a phenomenon that I find intriguing. I'm not saying they exist because I've never seen one. Mm-hmm. But other people stand by it. Other people stake their life on it. Other people say, look, I don't care what you think. I know what I saw. We could go on and on and on about it, you know, and as far like it's literally it's an hour long keynote I could give. But the bottom line is that for me as a film producer and an adventure and a creator, it's just it was fun. It is. It is fun. And it's intriguing. And so, you know, at the risk of being whatever about it, for those of you who, you know, thinks enough with the Bigfoot already. Don't do that crap. I can't believe you're hounding this. Are you doing this just for money? You're doing it. Uh, yeah, I have words for you that I probably shouldn't share on this show. I don't care. I don't care what you, you're like, man, I'm having fun with a phenomenon, making wonderful film and being cynical about it and not cynical, being skeptical about it, being realistic about it, wondering about it, opening my mind to it, not making fun of anybody, but also not taking them seriously if they're stupid. And just like, I was like, okay, I got to get out of this conversation, you know, just being realistic. And that's what people liked about the Survivor Man Bigfoot series did what Finding Bigfoot couldn't do. It took it actually seriously. Yeah. And that's what people love about that series, which is still being featured on the Outdoor Life Network today. Uh, so it's a it's a thing. Uh, again, I've had some very interesting, many, many now, very interesting experiences uh, that make me think, well, something's going on. Now, maybe it's all in my mind, but even if it's all up in here, either way, something's up in here and I want to find out what it is. So, you know, it's a lot of fun. And for those of us who love the outdoors, I mean, heck, if you're big into outdoor adventure, why wouldn't you be intrigued by by this? Well, you know, and you get that again, it's an hour long keynote. You know, we could go on forever with it. And I have done keynotes on it. And in the end, it's just like, come on, man, let's just have some fun with this. Yeah, yes, my friend David, you're a really big Bigfoot. monkey one, which you may be familiar with. David Pearson, he says, real or not, Bigfoot's a fascinating subject. It's a I fascinating agree. subject. So even if it, if it, even if the fascination is how, how intense these people who are into it are, like, it's still fascinating. You know, even if they're all wrong, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, yeah. so I do have a lot of fun with it, and I will do more. <laughs> awesome. Keep it coming, man. Um, okay, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna get set up here for the uh, the swag giveaway, and based on your comments saying that you would love to take some questions, I'm gonna drop the link to for everybody here in the chat right now. Um, I do have a couple of rules because I know there's gonna be a lot of people that might want to pop on screen to ask less a question. We're gonna try and keep it to one question if we can, please, just so that we could try and get a, as many in before the nine o'clock hour. Um, and then if, if, you know, if we run out of people, then maybe we'll let you ask another question, but I'll have you on for, on the screen, ask a question, let's, let's uh, answer, and then we will, uh, drop you back down and we'll move on to the next person. Sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan. All right. Uh, Les, if you'd like to take a quick little break, I'm just going to drop a quick video. We're going to get it, get on with the swag question, and then I'll have you back up as soon as the uh, swag giveaway is done. Thank you. <laughs> wow, man, this is a, uh, you know what, this is a dream come true for a guy like me, a small show, and I've got a fantastic uh, guest like Les Stroud on. Uh, we always got the, the the best people coming on to share their experiences with you, and uh, this is one of them. Uh, tonight's swag giveaway is uh, sponsored by our friends over at Algonquin Outfitters, and as an intro to that, I got a quick little video to share with you. Yeah, like I said, uh, Algonquin Outfitters celebrating their 60th anniversary in business. Uh, Kevin Callen has put out a great video. He uh, he toured around Algonquin Parks, hit all the uh, Algonquin Outfitters locations, spoke with the managers there as well as the owners. And you know what? It was a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, video. By all means, check it out. Uh, it is, I think he posted that today. 
uh, we'll maybe let you, him tell you a little bit about that later too. Uh, okay, so for tonight's swag giveaway, uh, we have the usual. We're giving away a Canoe Hound Adventures prize pack, which is going to include the decals, some uh, oops, some iron-on patches and stuff like that, as well as some uh, a couple of things from Algonquin Outfitters, including a one-day equipment rental for any equipment that they rent and a $25 voucher that can be used in-store if you ever visit a Algonquin Outfitters location. And we got all kinds of stickers and stuff like that as well. So for tonight's question, what I need you to do is I need you, and I'll leave this up on the bottom of the screen for a few minutes, but I need you to email your answers to coasprize at gmail.com by Saturday at 11. At that time, we will then do a drawing and I will notify the winner. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it that way, same way that we do it each week. And for tonight's question is, what year did the first Survivor Man season air on Outdoor Life Network and Discovery Channel? Uh, there's a, probably a couple of answers. Les said when he started his pilot on TV, we'll accept that uh, that answer. And we'll also accept when uh, his first season officially aired on OLN and Discovery Channel. I got the answer to this. I went on Wikipedia and I looked up Survivor Man and there's all kinds of interesting facts on Wikipedia about Les Stroud. So drop your answers to me at coasprize at gmail.com by Saturday at 11. And uh, let's try and make a winner out of you, all right? So we will then, let's see here, I'll leave the ticker going across the bottom and I'm going to bring Les back up here on panel if uh, Les is available. He may be uh, getting himself a beverage. There he is. There he is. All right. Welcome no, back, Les. Like, Thanks for your patience there. Doing the opposite of getting a beverage. I was making room for more beverage. <laughs> That's something I never get to do during the show. So if the screen goes black, Dennis is running to the to the potty. So that's cool. All right. We got a few people down here. It's in great the, juice, uh, by the way. Yeah. What, you still on a red wine? I'm still drinking no. a minivan. No, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. See? Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. There yeah. you go. <laughs> here in Southern Oregon, uh, so lucky to be in the Applegate Valley because, gosh, I'm just a choice of every single amazing winery going. Okay. Sorry, Andrew. Okay. okay so our, our first guest, I, I put this out to uh, some of my channel members and uh, gave them the link a little early in the anticipation that uh, they'd be able to ask a question. First person I'm going to bring up here on panel is a good friend, Darren from Ride Paddle Repeat. How are you doing tonight, Darren? Hey, I'm great. Thanks very much for having me, Dennis. Hi, Les. Can you hear him okay, Les? Uh, no, he cut out. He cut out. Okay. So this is Darren from Ride Paddle Repeat. What kind of question you got for uh, Les tonight, Darren? Thanks, Dennis. Hi, Les. So my question is regarding, uh, I guess, um, scouting out like the uh, the campsites and things like that. If you're in a viable situation or even recreation, right? I know you talk about your uh, free zones of assessment. But let's say uh, you know you're out stranded or you're caught in a portage trap or it's getting late and you just need to crash somewhere. What are like the top three things that you look for to find a, a suitable place to set up shop? Is this camping or survival? Uh, let's talk survival. I guess that's more appropriate. <laughs> survival is a little more, a little trickier too. Uh, so many variables. Uh, any way that I can get respite from the uh, bugs is going to matter if it's that kind of time of year. If it's not that time of year, the number one thing always for me is wind, wind, and wind. Uh, you know, a lot of things you can protect yourself from, but when the wind cuts through you, it's, it just chills you to the bone. Wind is actually far worse of an enemy than rain ever will be. Um, again, depending on the situation, I think primarily any way I can make a wind free place to be that way even if it di dips close to zero wind free makes all the difference now if i can have a fire going and i'm wind free i'm really doing well uh so i think you know aesthetics will never come into it you know being out where oh well it's pretty out here and i can see you know uh, i can see the lake and everything that that may matter with bugs it might it matters to be out in the open but if let's say there's no bugs then then i want to be away from the wind I want to be in a cubbyhole kind of situation. Now, mind you, I, I, I want to recognize that I'm completely invisible at that point. So I'm not doing any help for anybody who's looking for me. Uh, but I'm hunkering down. We have that phrase called hunkering down. This is when it really comes into play. You're caught off guard. You need to settle in for the night. Hunker down. Hunker down means get away from the wind. 
Uh, get in a place where if you can have a fire, that the heat is not lost, it's reflected to you. And then lastly, is comfort. You can't sleep sitting up all night. Try sleep sleeping in an airplane seat. It sucks. So believe it or not, making sure there is a degree of comfort to where you are matters. We tend to do these shelters and things and we curl up in the fetal position and we say, oh, I'll be good all night. You try sleeping in the fetal position all night. You get claustrophobic. You got to stretch your legs. Like, oh, I got to put my leg out. Oh, now you're kicking your foot out the shelter. Um, you're getting a Charlie horse and you're under the, you know, in your, in your quad. Oh my gosh, it's horrible. So comfort matters to get to be able to sleep through the night. I haven't even mentioned rain. Obviously, you want to be protected from the rain. But in any event, I would go, the quick knee-jerk answer is that, out of the wind, deep and dark down in a cubby hole, and comfortable enough that I could also stretch out my legs if I, if I, if I need, when I need to, not if, when I need to. But if you can have that fire right there, that's, that's, that's important. Cool. Awesome. Thanks very much, Les. Darren, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dennis. All righty. Uh, next uh, person we got here, I just put a list in the private chat in the order of uh, those of you in the basement that I'll be bringing up. And next we have uh, Marty Morissette. How you doing, Marty? Can't hear you, Marty. Still nothing? We'll let you get that ironed out. I'll bring up the next person, okay? All righty. We'll get Marty back up here in a second. Let's uh let's call up Russell. How you doing, Russell? Hey guys, good to see you tonight. Dennis. This is Russell you... from Raspberry Rock, the YouTube channel. Oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh you asked all my all my questions, so I don't have any good questions for you, Les, but uh <laughs> I do have one. Uh let's say Hap Wilson calls you. He says, We gotta go right now. Overnighter, yeah, grab grab whatever you can and go. You only have time for one camera. What are you taking with you? Good question. Good one, yeah. Only have time for one camera. What am I taking with me? As a fellow creator, I, I think about this all the time. Notwithstanding people's brand preference, uh, the latest Sony 4K. Yeah, you know, DSLR? Yeah, the thing is, uh, uh, no. No, actual video. No. Um, well, okay. bear in mind, look, I'm not a still photographer, so I don't come from the DSLR world. Most still photographers then go to video. I came from video filmmaking, so I, and I don't even do still photography. So I'm a video camera guy, and there are a lot of advantages to that. So for me, those little prosumer, if you will, Sony 4Ks, you can crop in and the edit on those things, and the quality is amazing now. I mean, I have 8K cameras, yes, but you ask for a grab-and-go my grab and go is going to be the little Sony 4Ks, but here's the key: with real audio, not onboard audio, real lav mics, a good lav mic, not crappy little Sony's, but a good uh, Sennheiser lav mic system. Hmm. Uh, uh, the, actually, the, the um, electronics, good electronics lav mic system. My Sony 4K. I'm good to go. If you allow me to throw in another one, I'll throw in a couple of GoPros. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to GoPro. And my Mavic Mini, too. So there you go. Gra yeah. If you said that right now, grab whatever you wanted. I grab the 4K, two GoPros, my Mavic Mini, too. Throw them in a, in, a, in a case, and I'm out the door. I'm I'm exactly the same way. I got my DSLR, well, DSLR GoPro, my, my drone. That's it. I'm going. Uh, I just want to add before you drop me. I just wanted to add with your comfort thing with you. We were, we were just talking about. Like I turned fifty-two this year, and I'm all about the comfort now. <laughs> As I get older, it's got to be more comfortable, or I'm just not having any fun. Look, I actually got asked one time by a mom. She said, "Listen, I I love the, you know, been in the rain all day, got a big fire, aching bones by the fire. How do I get my children to embrace the suck?" This was my answer. <laughs> Don't. Don't expect your kids to embrace the suck. Show them every comfortable way to be in the wilderness. Let them be super comfortable. All the gadgets, all the gear, all the technology, whatever it takes, just get them out in the wilderness. You make them hurt, they're going to hate it. Let them be out there comfortable. Then when they're ready, when a person is ready, that's when they'll know. a person knows when they're ready to embrace the suck. 
but don't don't throw your 16 year old yeah. into a miserable muddy cold and wet situation attempting to toughen them up like man show them you wouldn't do it so that's a big thing for me uh, always i might be survivor man but if you come out camping with me i have the best gear i can afford yeah that's you yeah, know you what could the always same decide to drop the gear later right so yeah the, the, the same thing goes for trying to get your significant other to to enjoy stuff like that. like to get my wife to come here to the cabin in the middle of the forest i had to put in amenities <laughs> proper bed you know a shower and you know just to get her and so be it and so be it i got a cabin up in tomogamy we have an outhouse i built a pea potty inside just for yeah. my wife you know and and there's no there's no shame in any of this. You know, the thing is that as, as Bill Mason said, being comfortable in the wilderness is an art form. There you go. Yep. Russell, right, thanks, thanks very much for coming up. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk to you later, Dennis. Hopefully we will touch base. Thanks man. Talk soon. <laughs> Bye. All righty. Yeah. You know what? I, I agree with that. Try and make people comfortable in the back country as comfortable as you can uh, possibly get them. Uh, Marty well, Morris. I'll, so, uh, I'll do an addendum interruption on you and say that, I always say the measure of a good guide is the guide who after four and a half days of solid rain can put up a tarp, get a big fire going, pass out the dark chocolate and scotch. That's a good guide. That's a God. Yep. Yeah, yep, for sure. All righty. I think Marty Morissette's good. Are you good, Marty? Are we? I don't know. Yeah, we're, you're good. We hear you now, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for letting me on. Les, uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, I, I found out about your series, Survive Man, when I was, I was about 20. And oddly enough, it's kind of funny when you share your life story. At the time, I was trying to be a rock star as well on tour when I found out about you. <laughs> and I was very unsuccessful, by the way. So don't even try to look on YouTube. But what I connected with immediately with what you were creating and, and as I got older and as I became myself a content creator on YouTube and started to make my own things is very much a lot more your artistic approach to what you were creating rather than your outdoor feats. Uh, not that they're, they're, they're very honorable, but my point is that what I really enjoyed your storytelling ability. And my question with that is, would you mind walking us through a little bit of that artistic approach when you would set out to go uh, on a survivor man series? So you'd go for seven days. I'm sure there's a lot of things you knew were, you could kind of anticipate would come up and you would want to tell that story so you would capture it right so example you go out in the colorado rockies with the horses you knew you had to tend for the horses so that you you probably could plan a little bit how you were but then there's all the events that you did not know were going to happen and the skill to be able to capture that and then take that and string it in your story so it's engaging all the time is what has always fascinated me within your work and that's what i try to do today on, on my channel and and, and I would just love to hear your artistic process to that. Ooh, that, that is a keynote that I would love to give and don't get asked often to give. Um, so I will try to keep it um, brief uh, for Canoe Hound Adventures. But, um, and it's a wonderful question. And it is a wonderful question because it's a wonderful part of everything I've ever done is the creative outflow and how I did that. I mentioned earlier about the necessity of it all. And the necessity was that I could never have made Survivor Man until the year 2000 when the Sony VX1000 or in about there came available for me because it was light. I actually shot a couple of Survivor Man with shoulder mount cameras, like big Sony digi beta cams. It was ridiculous. Well, the process is thusly. It is the process of having a very split mind. One side of me, because I was authentically and realistically surviving, had to be survivor man, had to be Les Stroud in the middle of the wilderness or the Amazon jungle, surviving. Okay, great. That's why I'm there. But what people missed is that I also had to chop myself right down the middle and say, the other half of me is, is a film producer, director, creator, storyteller. During seven days, I had opportunities where the survival was so difficult. Uh, is it okay? Can I swear or, or should I keep yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's been it's happened before. 
<laughs> I might have done it a few times on here. <laughs> I have to be careful because I also love working with the scouts a lot, and I try not to be careful, so I try not to drop drop too many f bombs or anything like that. But when you're in a real survival situation, there comes a point where you say, "Fuck the camera," and the reason for that is this is really serious right now. I'm in the middle of the Amazon jungle. That's a fertile loss. I got to do the right thing. I don't have time to grab my camera. Okay. The other half of the time, well, I got my shelter built. Got a fire going. I found this fish on the shore in Alaska. What can I film? And now I start to become creative. However, mm -hmm. in my situation, I'm halfway through without food in my stomach. My brain gets lost on what I thought I was going to do that week. So I legitimately had a crumpled piece of paper in my pocket and I'd pull it out and go, Oh, I was going to talk about the difference between the strawberry pincushion cactus and, and this other cactus. Well, oh, shit. Okay. Okay, I got to do that. And then I would, and then I'd go and so I had literally one sheet crumpled and yeah. dirty, reminding me I'm in Arizona. I was going to make a grass mat. I forgot I haven't made a grass mat yet. Okay, it's Thursday. It's, it's or it's day four, and I'm like lethargic. But my note says, make a grass mat. Oh, yeah, this is the perfect place to show how to make a grass mat, of course, in my pocket. So I did have a guide that way, and, and those things help. Now, this is obviously a survival situation, but I've done so many other series where it's not survival. And, and like beyond survival or Bigfoot, I was eating. I was happy and healthy. So the thing is you have to take pride in also not only your adventuring, but also your filmmaking. You have to be mm -hmm. schizophrenic because half of you is an adventurer going, oh, my God, I can't believe the network gave me $23,000 to go out and film this thing. And here I am in the middle of Bryce Canyon in Utah shooting this. This is like freaking awesome. <laughs> oh, shit. I better get busy. Right. So you got it. You got you the adventure, but you have the responsibility of the artist of being a filmmaker and going, I don't care how awesome it is. I better get that time lapse camera set up or. You know, and so to me, it was like, oh, I got to film this fireball. Well, if I put the camera up on that cliff, it would look amazing. Do I want to do that? No, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I should do it. All right, Stroud, do it. And I would go up and I'd set the camera up. So that's the thing. I had lots of guys send me things saying, I tried to do what you did. I don't know how you get it. It's like, you know what? I don't want to be insultive here, but you got to have the passion, man. You got to have the passion yeah. to be both a filmmaker artist and a survival guy at the same time, or in your case, maybe an adventurer, or if you're doing a hunting show or a fishing show or whatever show, you have to split the difference. And I would do that a lot. Now, I'll tag this off by saying that with necessity being the mother of invention, it meant that I had to do certain things certain ways. I can point to at least six to eight different maneuvers that are done with your camera that nobody did before Survivor Man. And I had to do it. And then other guys came along and they did it when they didn't even have to do it because they had a camera crew, but they pretend to do it. I was like, dude, I had to hold the camera. You're pretending to hold the camera. It's just stupid. So I had things that way. Same thing, last thing, my word on this, and here's my, my advice to you as a content creator. Uh, you might not like this next bit of advice. I had a brilliant, now at first I did everything myself, yes. But I had an absolutely brilliant editor named Barry Farrell. And having a brilliant editing partner is the answer to a lot of things. I know so many people that do everything themselves. It's not the answer. You want to be like a rock band. Hey, you'd understand this analogy. You want to be, you're creating a show, be Rush, right? Power trio, not Sting, a soloist. There's very few Stings out there. There's very few Neil Youngs. But there are lots of power trios and there are lots of quartets. Led Zeppelin is four people, right? So in filmmaking, my partner, Barry Farrell, was absolutely brilliant. He could see and do things with the edit that I never would have done. And so if you can find yourself, a, or maybe you prefer the editing and you should have a filmmaker, but, but if you like the camera work, you like being out there, yeah. the editing, sure, you can do it. But... And every filmmaker out there hearing me, hearing this right now, let me say this to you as a, as a veteran of 30 plus years in the filmmaking business, I'm saying this right now. 
if your love is being out there and doing the filming, running the camera, telling the story, don't edit your own work. You will not edit as well as somebody else who's being critical and judging your, they'll, you'll be like, you'll be like, but I spent eight hours getting that shot. Why aren't you using it? And the editor will go, because it sucks and it doesn't tell the story. <laughs> but I spent eight hours. Yeah, but it's I sucks. get a lot of that. <laughs> right. So it's really key to find those people, you know, to this day, look, I edited three quarters of surviving disasters with Lester Strap or PBS. Chris Franchetto came in and saved my bacon on the final act. My work's fine. I'm a good editor, but it's, it's, you, you got to team up, man. So that is the best mm. advice I can give is find yourself someone who likes to sit and you look really fit. You don't look like the guy <laughs> who wants to spend the next 18 hours up behind a computer, drinking loads of coffee at, Find the person, male or female, old or young, who likes to do that. They will edit you a great show. There you go. That's awesome. And thank you so much. And I, I love to hear the little behind the story that you had your little paper. It just, I can, I can relate to the concept of wanting to talk about something and forgetting. Mind you, I never oh. had to survive, but oh, I, but I, I always bring notes. The worst thing is to come home from your trip and go, Oh, we never no. filmed that scene where we take a <laughs> canoe off the roof. Uh, I hate that yeah. feeling, man. You well done. Yeah, have a checklist good. and check it off. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate Thanks, it. Marty, Thanks, Marty. Appreciate you evening. coming on and uh, joining Les and I on screen. Cheers. Okay, buddy. Talk later. All Sorry right. That, but he, he asked me a filmmaking question. As you can tell, I get very yeah, passionate and that's a passion. about filmmaking. For sure. Yeah. I've got uh, four more people in the basement right now uh, with questions and we'll get through them. I don't think we'll, uh, I don't know if we'll have enough time to get any more people. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to bring somebody up that I know has to leave because they have to be on by nine o'clock for one of their own shows. So I'm going to bring uh, Jess up from rain dance bushcraft and I'll get to Kevin, David and Karina in a short bit. So hold on guys. All right. So this is Jess from rain dance bushcraft. How are you doing Jess? I'm all right. Can you hear me? I can hear you, man, loud and clear. Oh, nice. My system's working. Um, I'm going to be really brief. Uh, Les, for me, I've always been like a two-faceted artist, if I can say that. Um, <clears throat> I went to school to make movies, so I've always appreciated that. And I view what you did holding a camera by yourself as kind of the primordial version of what a lot of us as outdoor YouTubers do. So I've always sort of felt a connection there. But also, um, I'm in a band. Uh, I'm the world's most okay bass player. <laughs> and um, what I'm wondering is uh, the current pandemic has stopped my band cold. And a lot of what you do depends on travel. And, you know, in a musical uh, context, there's people everywhere. And when you're going off to shoot somewhere, there's travel and stuff. And I'm just wondering, is your life really different right now in terms of your, your process on, on both of those fronts? Because I see them both as being potentially very affected by the world we're in right now. So in desire, no. In intent, nope. In agendas I set my, for myself, Relatively speak, speaking, nope. The only way it's truly different is logistically. And it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a logistical nightmare. But what am I going to do? Sit at home and complain about it? Or find the airline and the flights that will get me to where I got to go? Right now, just before getting on Canoe How Ad Adventures, I was trying to book my flights to Belize because I'm filming an episode of Wild Harvest on board uh, Aggressor Live Aboard Yacht. In, in Belize and it's a freaking nightmare trying to get these guys booked and I legitimately have to spend an extra night in a location to make it work okay so uh, the shorter answer is what I'm getting to here is a bigger answer revolving around the current state of affairs in the world these days which is pivot everybody just learn to pivot learn to pivot and do what you meant to do and do what you want to do and and don't start moaning and complaining about i can't do this and i can't look i get it i'm i'm clamped by handcuffed by logistical nightmares these days don't care just got back from alaska i'm still tested positive 
I still went up there. I saw the bears. I filmed the bears. I went hiking. I went sea kayaking. I, I did my meet and greet. I came home. I'm still tested. Uh, sorry. I said positive. Tested negative. I'm still tested negative. I do all the testing. I do all of that. Well, and I'm here I am after, you know, a million times having something shoved up my nose. <laughs> and yet I still went out and did what I needed to do and got it done. So, so yeah, short answer, Jess, is, is that sure logistically speaking yeah it's a it's a hassle and a nightmare philosophically speaking so what so what let's pivot let's get strong again let's turn and do what we want to do with our own personal lives that's why i refuse to get involved in political life and the big life and all that stuff because i'm more i'm just self-centered enough to to be worrying about my personal life you know that Pandemic. What I love about what you just said is, is it goes back to something that I, I read by you once where you said that the mindset is the biggest difference between someone who will survive when the shift, Dennis, hits the fan and someone who won't or when you get lost out in the woods. And I've tried really hard to take that philosophy on as well because I think that that uh, rings very true. So I, like, I'm kind of hearing that and what you're saying. Yeah, Jess, I think I can be accused sometimes of being insensitive. Um, uh, uh, but the reality is a lot of times a lot of me wants to say, hey, everybody, I know this hurts, but let's suck it up. Let's suck it up and move forward. Put that next foot forward because it doesn't matter. What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? Right. Well, I can't, I can't, I can't. Fine. You can't those three ways, but you can these two ways over here. So let's find our route around to these two ways right. or pivot, change what it is. There are things I cannot do right now that I would like to do. Okay. Case in point, what's a box I want to check off on my to-do list. I really want to go and hike by myself through Nepal and Tibet. Mm. I can't not allowed to China won't allow it because right. you have to have a tour guide, all this stuff. So now I'm like, okay, now I'm scratching my head. Okay. But what can I do? That's where I'm at. It's always like that. What can you do? Never mind what you can't do. What can you do? Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very true. Very true. All right. Thanks a lot. Jeff, thanks very much for coming up, man. Yeah, I'm gonna head out now. Okay, thanks buddy. I may see you a little later. All right. Bye bye. Cheers. All right. So we got three more in the basement. Yeah. You know what? These are some great questions. That's that's why I always like to bring up uh, people from the from from the chat. Uh, you know, less a lot of them have different ideas when it comes to questioning. You know, and it sort of broadens the whole thing, right? Uh, we've got three more in the basement. Um, I'm going to bring up a, a past guest that has been on the show before. Well, actually, all three of them have been on the show many times. But uh, a good friend here from uh, the YouTube channel, Really Big Monkey One, we have Mr. David Pearson. How are you doing, David? Long time hey, no see. Doing good. Hey, Les. Up? Can y'all hear me? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Okay. <clears throat> I got kind of a two-part question. And one of them is, is Les, I'm the guy that was at Smoky Mountain Knife Works that gave you the grill. You remember it? Of course I do. Are you kidding? 1,700 people showed up that day. I will never forget that day. And see, it was depressing because me and my son built, built that grill for you. And there was a million people. I, 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 I had like 30 seconds with you. And I still have it. I was wondering, did you hang it on the wall or did you, did no, you cook I still on have it? it? And, 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 and case in point, I am, I am not, you know, fibbing you right now. I know where it is right now. It's at my cottage in Northern Ontario, Canada. And I, and I actually have it hung up on the wall in a place you can see it. If you go into my cottage to this day. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Cause see, you know, that thing is a hundred percent pure stainless steel and mm -hmm. it's meant for, it's meant for cooking. I know. You know dig, dig a hole, set it over it. And we thought it'd be cool. You could have cooked the steak and it'd, it'd burn your name in it. I haven't done that yet, but I promise you, as I'm sure as I'm sitting here, it was in my fingers as recent as five months ago when I was up at the cottage and I was doing some shuffling around and some artwork and different things. And I, where, where's, I want to put this somewhere where it can be seen. And it's boom, it's on the wall. I promise you that. That's awesome. That's great. I'd love to see I, a picture of that. No, like the of the grill, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he, as the grill he just held up, except it's got my name Les Stroud in it. And oh, it's, cool. just, it's like that, but so, it's got my name sort of welded I, into it. I bent the letters out by hand. It said Les Stroud and welded yep. them in. 
And now that I know that that was one of your your goals, David, uh, uh, I will try to remember. Uh, and if I shoot a, a, an episode of Wild Harvest up there, I'll see if I can get Chef Paul to cook a steak on my name. <laughs> that would be, cool. that would be incredible. Yeah. Now, the, the other question, and I think this will help everybody out because I, I, I've only heard you mention it once. And people talk about how bad the Georgia swamps are. But could you give a quick rundown of how bad that parasite is you picked up in the Georgia swamp? Yeah. And, and, and as far as picking it up there, that's my conjecture. But hard to figure out where else I got it. Uh, it was uh, a parasite that that it seemed to invade the inside of my mouth. Now you figure, oh, you get like, oh, you got like what, like a blister in there? Yeah, kind of like that. But after a while, I go to I go to bed at night. The roof of my mouth would look like the roof of my mouth. I wake up in the morning, and it looks like somebody took a red marker and drew squiggly railroad tracks all over the roof of my mouth. And so whatever it was never left my mouth. It didn't show up anywhere else on my body didn't cause any, but it stayed there. And um, I saw dentists, the number one dentist in North America. I saw different. And I finally, I remember seeing a um, disease specialist. This guy is uh, Dr. Keystone. This is one of the, the, the number one third world disease specialists going. And I opened my mouth and I was fortunate that I happened to be there on a day in my doctor's appointment with a full outbreak. Because, you know, someone's like, I'm telling you, doc, it was there. Well, it was there. I opened my mouth. He looked at it. He's just shaking his head. He goes, uh-oh. And then he goes, I have never seen anything like this before. And I'm just like, oh, that's just great. And so he prescribed some kind of what I call the kill everything in your system drugs. And he gave me something that would kill everything in my system. And, and it, it, to this day, I will get the odd little burning tingle. And I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, oh, I hope it's not coming back. And it hasn't come back. But I get this little feeling back in there, and I, I, just, I just don't want it to ever come back. That pill got, those pills got rid of it. I'll never know what it was, and I was pretty sure I got it in Georgia. I was just fixing to say, there's some stuff in the Georgia swamps and the Florida swamps that are just nasty. Yeah. I believe I ate... I ate a turtle in that episode, and I believe that that was the problem. I didn't quite cook it properly, and you know, I was early in my career and doing that sort of stuff. And yeah, I think that's what the problem was. Awesome! Wow, my favorite. Thank awesome. you so much. And thanks Hopefully for that. You don't get that down there, uh, David, because uh, I know you're down that area. So, and oh David, no, I'm uh, not. I'm just, very leery. <laughs> Well, David, I just want to say again, you know, thanks so much for the grill. Um, as I'm sitting here, I do have it, as you can tell from my story. And I will try to remember the next time and uh, and get that Les Stroud via the, the, the David Pearson grill burned into the steak. That'd be cool. That's a good idea. <laughs> that would be awesome. All right. Great talking to you. Thanks for having David, me on. stick around in the green room down there. I'd like to talk to you after the show if possible. Okay, yeah. I will. Okay, All buddy. Right. Thanks very much for coming up on screen. We'll talk to you shortly. All right. See you. All right. Yeah, man. You know what? For anybody that's not familiar with David Pearson, he's uh, quite the bushcrafter and has quite the bushcrafting channel. Check him out at Really Big Monkey One. Uh, he, if you want, David, feel free to throw it in the chat there. Uh, by all means, that'd be a great thing to get connected with uh, David's uh, channel. So we got two more in the basin. We got Karina and Kevin. Kevin, please bear with me. I see you down there, and I'm not putting you aside for any particular reason, except I'd like to have you last on the show. So, anyways, uh. Everybody's familiar with the next person that I'm going to bring up on screen. And this is uh, Karina from the YouTube channel Alexis Outdoors. And is she frozen up? I think she's frozen up. We'll let Karina re-log in. And I guess we will bring Kevin up on screen. Ah, Kevin, you're up, buddy. Uh, hold on for this one for a second here, Les. Hi, I'm Kevin Collin, the happy camper. Woo! Yes, I'm Apostle number 14. Well, if you visited me instead, you would have been fine. It's a one sexy beast, I'm telling you. You know, I told you poopy pants, sorry about that. Did you really? <laughs> I will hold in my urine for you, Dennis. You have to remind Kevin that this is a family show. What about the chipmunks? Awesome. Hey, this is our good friend, Kevin. Kevin, Les, Kevin is a regular on the show. Oh, uh, I know, He gets Kevin. his own introduction, right? I know Kevin all too well. I can't believe that, you know, the show has sunk to new depths. Cheers! <laughs> Cheers! Or risen oh. to new heights. I'm not sure which. 
And, and Les, did you see what uh, Dennis did? Oh, you know, the, the, the person, oh, uh, we can't get her on, uh, so we'll have Kevin fill in. You're a fill-in, Kevin. Yeah. You are, yeah. You are a fill-in, Kevin. Yeah, welcome to my life. And I think I hurt your feelings. Oh, my God. I, I got a really good uh, question for you. Um, I've been uh, a lot of shows with you, spent a lot of time with you. Amazing person, amazing career. I also remember those one moment where I was at a, 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 at a show and you were on stage and you were performing one of your songs, which I love. I think you were an amazing musician. Amazing. Okay? Oh, he could stay on. No, no, no but you are. You are. And oh, if I can I, interrupt. I, you were about to perform and the organizer of the show, and there had to be like, you know, a thousand people in the audience. He comes up to me and he goes, oh, if you could just talk about bushcraft, what the hell is he doing? Les, get your guitar. I know you're a performer. You gotta have a guitar somewhere. Come on. I don't have any guitars handy. Anywhere. Come on. Oh, yes, he's you already know. played harp at all. So I don't know what you're talking about. No, Les, Les, do us a favor and do one of your songs. That would be amazing. Come on. Uh, did you put him up to this, Canoe Hound? I, I did, did not put him up to this, but I I like where he's going with it. But you, you know, know what, Les? Just for the record, <sighs> Kevin Kevin's favorite. Musical artist is actually on screen right now. I know, and yeah, I was right, right over his uh, right shoulder. I will say to you, oh, that I am John Denver. <laughs> I am not even uh, a closet John Denver fan. I am an uber John Denver fan. I still watch the Wildlife Concert Series at least twice a year to this oh, day. Yeah. yeah, as far as I'm concerned, he is one of the most brilliant artists of all time, yeah. and yeah. very underrated amongst the. Oh, he got whitewashed as being soft. And when you really, truly listen, for one thing, I think any song is the greatest love song of all time. Uh, poems, prayers, and promises. Yeah. 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 Come on. Come on. Let's give us a song. Oh. Hang on a second there. Oh, for goodness sakes. Okay. You know what? This, this is incredible. Um, I, I, I would actually love it, though, if, if Les could close out the show with music and we could have Karina come on with her question. Oh, no. Her. Her internet did not work, Dennis. Oh, she's like, got, oh. she's live down there. She's waving at me and smiling. And um, actually, uh, yeah, less uh, serious set up. I, this was a, a serious thing I wanted to. You know, uh, yes, it was a good point uh, when that happened. When he said, "I wish you could just do the bushcraft," I said, "And it, it's funny, you would love this." I said to the guy, "He's got the stage." Right now, thousand people are watching. I think you do what he wants to do. Thank you for that. Thank you for backing me up. Well, um, that's that's been a thing. You know, we were talking about this right in the beginning of the conversation. You know, when I said, "Hey, I used to blow harmonica so that people would understand that I wasn't a one-trick pony." What do we think? We're all one-dimensional. That all we do is start fires all day long, and all we do is build shelters all day long. And you know, that doesn't belittle my passion for outdoor skills or how much I love doing a fire bow. It's just that there's more to all of us than, than, you know, one dimension. And, uh, you know, and, and so I thank you for that. You know, uh, um, uh, I'm glad you were there to say that to him and whoever it was, he was wrong. Here's it's a little out of tune. I'm just going to let it be out of tune. I haven't played in months. <laughs> I don't even remember the lyrics, Kevin. Something like, you camp on the land, a boat on the sea. I face life, and you can't be free. Yeah. Always find a way. Forty hours of work we were never meant for me. Lately I've been bitten by the bug that sets us free. Wilderness wandering, and ocean waves are calling. Standing in a forest, you can hear when trees are falling. Oh, 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 oh. this is free. Oh, 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 oh. 
Without rehearsal, that's all you get. That's <laughs> awesome. That's <laughs> amazing. Uh, that's strong. amazing. That's, I, so glad that you did that. Uh, and really, this is not set up at all. I, that, it was the one question I had. I was traveling today, and I thought, hey, I, I got to check out the show tonight. And if I have a question, what would it be? And and, and I remember that moment. Um, that moment of, Interesting. you know what? Yeah, he's done amazing things. Uh, and you really have uh, do all your shows and still are doing amazing things. But your music is really kind of cool. And people should check it out. Well, you know, Kevin, I think um, in the world of uh, doing music about nature, first of all, John Denver ran supreme. Um, but there are those of us who have been doing it on and off for a long time. And I see Karina is picking up her guitar. Uh, but uh, uh, Ian Tamblin, brilliant, beautiful music of Ian Tamblin, the stuff that he's written along with Kevin, Kevin uh, Kloss. Um, David Hatfield, brother of the other famous guy, but David yeah. is more famous in my books as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, you know, songs like Little Black Fly and things like that. If you actually listen to the stuff that I'm doing, my last album, Bitter and Lake, um, my new album, Mother Earth, the new stuff that I have coming out, one's called Cold as the River, one's called Leaving It All Behind. It's all about nature. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, uh, the stuff that, that, you know, hey, you'll never see a poor man... Uh, uh, if you've never seen an eagle fly, that's a John Denver quote, you know, uh, I think, you know, I just love that there is still artists that write about nature and sing about nature. It's not corny. It's not hokey. It's not cheesy. Not if you've ever paddled a canoe on a, on a seven day canoe trip in Northern Ontario, those songs are, are not, they, they, they touch our souls. And I will continue to write that way and continue to do music about nature. And, and uh, I, Kevin, I'm so happy to see John in behind you there on that album. As I said, as you can tell by my words that, yes, the wildlife concert is like, that's like my church. You know, I'll go to the wildlife concert and just, you know, I will say this. John Denver is the only artist that has ever truly made me cry just by singing about nature. You know, so there you go. I'm with you, buddy. All right. That's awesome. It's we awesome. Yes, I'm okay. gonna, I'm gonna, Cheers, we're going to get drunk now and listen to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're in control. Uh, well, it's good to catch up and uh, and way to go. You did awesome things and you're still doing awesome things. Keep it up, Kevin, and also keep up your your enthusiasm for the paddling world. I uh, enthusiasm for the paddling world. I'm with you on it, buddy. I know I've done these other things, but in the end, I'm just a guy. Who loves to paddle a canoe? I still have my Cedar Strip canvas canoes, and I still paddle. And and I also think that Les actually does a single blade, not a double blade. Just saying. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, stick around in the basement. There, we'll talk to you in a short bit if you can. God right, bless bye. the J stroke. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Kellen, always a pleasure to have on the show. Ke I always tell you, Kevin has his own intro, less because I, I call him like my uh, my Ed McMahon, right? To Johnny Carson. Not, not that I, I could even <laughs> shake a stick at most, Johnny most Carson, but most, no, he's most a great guy. man in, uh, in canoe show business. Yes, for sure. Um, if, here, here's a young lady that me, needs no introduction. This is uh, Karina from the YouTube channel, Alexis Outdoors, and I see she's pulled out her axe too. So, uh, yes. You got a question for Les, Karina? Yeah, yeah. So the guitar was a ploy. I'm definitely not playing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sorry about that. We have, like, a pretty good thunderstorm here, and uh, I lost my internet, but now I'm on my phone, so it's all good. Uh, so very nice to meet you, Les. Um, you're a huge inspiration to me, as probably everybody uh, watching it has been. Um, so my question to you is, uh, so as, as Dennis said, I, I do have a YouTube channel. Um, and I'm kind of at a point right now where I'm torn between doing the types of videos that I love and the types of videos that I know will be more successful. And I'm wondering, like, you've always been able to do, create things that are different 
and create things that no one else really has done and they've been unique and they've also been successful. So I'm wondering, have you ever had to choose between those two? <laughs> um, every single day of my life. Yeah. <laughs> it never goes away. It's a constant. I could go do a here's how to build a shelter video and here's how to find Bigfoot video tomorrow and get hundreds of thousands of views. I could do something I more want to do and get 3,800 views. Yep. Uh, it will never leave. But you don't want to hold the things that you can do for money, for example, in contempt. You don't, I mean, certainly there's no selling out going on. I do enjoy showing how to do a good shelter. I do enjoy dabbling into Bigfoot. I, I this and that. Do I wish that 400,000 people would sign on and watch me playing live in concert? Yeah, I do. Yeah. But case in point, we had David, uh, David on from Smoky Mountain uh, Knife Works. I went down there to do a meet and greet. So I'll tell you the story here. I went down there to do a meet and greet. It was meet and greet survivor, man. Almost 1,700 people showed up. There were people lined up at 5 a.m. to meet and greet with Les Stroud survivor, man. Fast forward to a few years later, I went down to the same area, similar area, not very far away, did a concert in a, in a performance arts center. 98 people showed up. And so I'm not heartbroken by that. I'm not heartbroken at the time. <laughs> so to answer your question, though, I think what you do or what I do anyway, just like you need to be responsible to life and need to be responsible to the bills you have to pay and things like that, you you utilize the things you would you can do like spice and you sprinkle it in so that the money and the financing of your life and the organizing of being responsible fiscally still moves forward we're not all picasso well hell even picasso sold out for tons of money when he was in his 20s right so you do those things like a bit of spice here and there. And it's not that you do them begrudgingly. And it's not that you do them to appease the fans. You do them because you want to. You just know that, okay, today I'm going to go show people how to build this shelter. Right. Tomorrow I'm going to perform two of my new songs. And I know that nobody's going to watch when I perform my two, my two new songs, but I'm going to really love that. And I know that I'm not a, desperately in love with building another shelter, but my the people, the, my fans, huh, the people who are there really love me for, love seeing that stuff. So it's not about pandering. It's not even about appeasing. It's about, uh, look, I just watched the new documentary last night called Val. About Val. And he gets to the part where he talks about uh, being offered to continue to do be Batman. And he turned it down. Because as an actor, it just, you know, and it kind of really hurt his career in many ways. You know, I'm a big fan of not selling out, but I'm not stupid. I have bills to pay. I don't know. I'm, I'm meandering yeah. now. I'm rambling a little bit now, but I, I, I guess I'm saying I feel your pain because I could be survivor man for the next 30 years. But do I, do I want to be in many ways? I kind of am and I can't escape it. But by the same token, I got a new album. You know, I got a kid's book. You know, I got, I got other things, you know, so that's, that's my answer is, is use it responsibly and honor, honor the stuff that people want you for that make you the money, but don't ever stop doing the things that you also just want to do. Because here's the thing, I'll end it this way. I now have people, I now have people that come up to me that like me for my music and never watch the Survivor Man. And when that happened, yeah. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you. You have my album and you didn't even know I had a show called Survivor Man. Oh my God, you're my new best friend. You know, <laughs> I met a guy recently in, in Alaska who was the biggest wild harvest fan. He didn't know that I had a series called Survivor Man. So you eventually, now those are few and far between compared to Survivor Man, but I'll take them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure.
Yeah, you got to break that persona sometimes, right? Or try to break the persona. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, come on, man. I mean, some of the artists we love the best did all kinds of different things, you know. I grew up in an era of following people like David Bowie, you know. And and uh, so, you know, you got to sometimes you just got to go, hey, this is what I'm doing now. And if you're good, people people come along. Sometimes you got to dip and go back up again. Yeah, I think I feel like that always happens when you're creating stuff. It's like you dip a little bit, you think it's going to do so well, and then you dip. And then all of a sudden you put something out that you didn't weren't really totally passionate about, but it happened to do well. So it's, yeah, I'm trying to find the balance between those two. Both. Well, I do both. appreciate it. Do both. And the point of doing both is, like I was saying earlier with the pandemic conversation and stuff like that, suck it up. You're an artist. Create. Yeah. Yeah, suck it up, do it, do both, do more. Oh, but I have to stay up late and I've got kids. And then, yeah, well, then don't be an artist. Don't <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm running two channels now. So, <laughs> there, you go. there you go. You know, life's short. Life is short. And, you know, look at Canoe Hound, Hound Adventures. I mean, he's got this thing going on here and it's awesome. I mean, he could get tired of it. You could get tired of it really quickly, couldn't you? And you could say, you know, I don't know, man, I'm not getting the numbers I wanted or I'm not getting this that I want, you know, or, Suck it up and keep doing it. Keep doing it. It's fun. It's life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We're, we're kind of there, man. Look, at when you get to meet great people like yourselves, it makes it all worth a while for sure, right? So, yeah. And by the way, um, Brandon over there <laughs> definitely contributed to that question. <laughs> How you doing there? <laughs> hey, <man. laughs> he's, the, he's the star of Timber, Timber Maids, our other channel. There you go. We just got to keep them up, people. You know, Karina and uh, Alexis uh, Outdoors uh, and then Timber Meats. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna let you close out the show because I know you have to. But I will say, like, this is, isn't isn't it a wonderful thing that we can create things that um, enrich other people's lives? You know, I will say this, um, uh, Karina. Uh, are you Karina or Alexis? I, I'm I'm confused. Both. <laughs> Alexis yeah. is my middle name. Ah. Karina's my first name. <laughs> Here's my bit of advice. Don't just do this for business. I, I I hate business. I like no, and that fails pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, you gotta just create, man. Keep creating. The money follows, but just create, man. This world is is short, and and we have these opportunities to put stuff out that enrich. Like Kevin and I were just talking. Kevin has been a canoe head since the day is long, and he's still a canoe head. And why not? You know, why not keep putting this stuff out? You know, that's that's what I that we talked earlier about my being me being prolific and 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 not retiring and, and so on. It's because you know I'm not done yet. You know, I'm not finished yet. I, I asked Bruce Coburn one time, you know, why do you keep doing it? And he said, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> that shut me up pretty darn quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah you've yeah. had the opportunity to meet several, several big names, eh, in the music industry and stuff like that. So very fortunate. Yep. Awesome. Karina, thank you very much for coming on. Feel free to stick around in the green room for after your show conver conversations. Thank you and, very uh, much, Les. Very nice meeting you. And thanks so much, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Les, you know what? Can I can I get in a couple turbo questions here? Uh before the end of the show. One one is I wanted to ask. You were talking about the about the parasite you had in your mouth. Wild edibles, when it comes to that, have you ever had a bad experience with something? Now, I'm not talking about the experience you had in Pow Pow New Guinea with those things that you took and you know, the, the nut and the leaf and all that you stuff. Know, yeah. But have no, you, have you ever had something that was not right? My very first show, uh, actually, uh, I, um, yeah, just eating uh, a, a rotten pond lily tuber. Um, it was horrid. Um you know, you, 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 yeah, yeah, sure. The short answer is yeah. The sago larva in Sibirut when I was doing the series called Beyond Survival. And I want to say that for everybody watching, if they're still here after all this time, is that, you know, my YouTube channel, Sir I'm Man Les Stroud, everything I've ever done is there for free. That's the wonderful thing about owning your own content is I put everything out there. And so Beyond Survival, that series, when I ate the sago larva, that was just, that was like putting milk in a Ziploc bag, leaving it in the sun for two weeks and then chewing into it. It was disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. And are those coconut hearts really that good? The dried up coconuts? Oh, those... yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. When I go I down to Belize in a couple of weeks to film a new episode of wild harvest, I'm fine in one of those coconut husks because yeah. you get them with that growth. That's about eight inches high and you open it up and you get that white apple like out of it. Oh yeah. Wow. It's awesome. Cool. Is that, is that kind of gelatinous? Is it like jelly like, or is it uh, like, like eating coconut? No, it's sponge like. 
Okay. Like sponge toffee. Okay. I think next time I go down to the Caribbean, I might have to keep my eyes open as I'm walking down the beach for one of those bad boys. So cool. Well, you know what, Les, I, I have to thank you a million, man. Uh, like I said, at the, at the top of the show as a fan, uh, this is a real thrill and a privilege for me to have you on the show. Thank you very much for gracing myself and all the viewers tonight uh, with your presence and answering questions and telling stories. My pleasure. You know, I mean, <laughs> you got you. This sounds very terribly vain. You got through because of the title of your show, Canoe Hound. Oh, Canoe Hound. Oh, it's got to be like-minded people as far as I'm concerned. And here I am. Um, I, I, in the end, I am a canoe head and I will be a canoe head till the day I die. And uh, I paddled Wabakimi this year uh, for about 10 days and, and just loved it. And uh, I know Hap's not listening anymore, but I plan on a trip with Hap and I plan on doing the Nahani again soon. It's been a while. So I will always be a canoeist. I will always be an outdoor adventurer, regardless of the film work that I do. So I'm really proud and happy to be part of your show. Well, that's great. You know what? My, my slogan is keep the adventures alive, Les. I bless you. And I, I say keep the adventures alive. Agreed. If, uh, if you don't mind, can you just uh, hang around for a bit there? I'll drop you into what I call the green room. And when I'm closed out the show there, I'd like to uh, just talk to you for a few minutes uh, and uh, a few of the others. And uh, we'll go on from there. Sir, you you remain in the best of health. You take care. And, uh, man, I hope to see you again. I did meet you briefly at the Toronto Outdoor Adventure Show for a quick handshake. But that was about it because you were swamped and uh, I was out of there. So uh, I hope to meet you again someday. You bet. Take care. Thanks, Les. Have a great one. Wow. What a fantastic show. Uh, hopefully everybody really enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, it was a really difficult thing for me not to fangirl throughout this entire show, because like I say, I really have followed less uh, since like, you know, back 2005 with all the Sur Survivor Man episodes. And I've watched everyone like numerous times. I'm on his YouTube channel all the time. And I'm even going to pick up one of his children's book for my young grandson that's 10 months old. So I got to get one of them because he has autographed copies on his website. All the information to Les Stroud, all his social media and his website can be found in the uh, description below. If you're not familiar with them, which I doubt, I'm sure everybody is, but go on, check out his social media, check out his YouTube channel. Like you said, he's got his entire collection on there. Uh, right back to right to right to the beginning, right up until now. So uh, you'll definitely want to check that out. Uh, really quickly, I just want to point out that next week on the show we have Hunter and Harris Paddles are going to be on the show. We're going to be talking about everything canoe paddles. And uh, let's see to to those of you that the new channel members, I've seen I had one or two new channel members pop in. Please drop me an email at canoehound at gmail.com. Anybody's interested in becoming a channel member, click on that join button down here and. Uh, get some information. And also I seen, I had a few super chats come in. I got super chats and you know what that relates. And it comes right back to you next week. I will sweeten the pot for our swag giveaway. I'll throw in a hat or a t-shirt or something like that, because any money that comes into the channel uh, goes right back out to those of you that passed me on birthday wishes. Thank you very much. Uh, this guy's one day older and uh, we're going to keep it that way. Anyways, if you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up. If you haven't already done so, please do hit that subscribe button. And remember, people, until next week, keep the adventures alive. You all have yourselves a great week, and we'll talk soon. Cheers.